after the announcements that those two hostages have been released by Hamas. Uh, we wanted to speak with filmmaker Paul Martin, who... Good morning, Paul. Good, Good to morning, speak morning, to you. Paul. Now, you were captured, morning. weren't you, by the group, by Hamas, in 2010, mercifully released after being held for four weeks. I mean, I can't imagine what that was experienced like, but what it has given you is a unique perspective to the terror that those some 200 will be feeling. Tell us briefly the circumstances in which you were taken hostage. Yes, well, I suppose you could say I was... Uh, I knew Hamas from the inside. <laughs> um, but uh, seriously, it was a very unpleasant experience. Uh, to some extent, there's an occupational hazard in being a foreign correspondent who goes to war zones, things can go wrong. In this case, I was making a film about a Palestinian rocket firer who had changed his mind about firing rockets into civilian areas and felt that he should try to make peace with Israel. He had a friend on the Internet for the first time ever in his life who was an Israeli, and he changed his mind. It was a nice subject for a documentary. But, well, uh, but it was, he was a hopeful arrested. subject of peace. Do you think the fact that he was seeking peace and had changed his mind is what sparked Hamas turning against you and the whole thing? Yes, I mean, indirectly, in the sense that he was locked up for having left his militant group. You can't do that kind of thing. You already no. know where weapons are, you know the people. And so to leave your group is a dangerous thing to do. To make a film with a foreign filmmaker is even more dangerous, although they didn't know that we were making one at the time. But he was locked up, threatened with execution, which is the norm for anyone who's accused of being too friendly yes. in, somewhere with the Israelis. And I gave evidence in his military trial, and they said I was his spy master. So you were arrested basically on, on trumped-up spying charges. Uh, now, we don't know where these 200-plus hostages are being held. We know, obviously, they're on the Gaza strip somewhere. There's a lot of speculation they're being held in the tunnels uh, under, underground. Where were you held and what were the conditions like and how did they treat you? Yes, my situation is different to the hostages in many ways. I was held in an over, overground prison, a secret prison, run by internal security. There are various militant organisations within Hamas. And um, I was held in a reasonable room to start with, but uh, after a while they explained they had to have me executed, um, which wasn't a pleasant piece of information. They were going to use a British law to execute me from the mandate period pr prior Can to... Can I ask you how they gave you that information? Did they give it to you aggressively, uh, with sort of faux regret? I mean, how was the information passed on to you that you don't Well, I had a you? team of three interrogators who mm -hmm. did a proper job of interrogating. They, they put lots of things together, like two and two made 22, <laughs> if you see what I mean. But, um, <clears throat> but they said that they had this law and I was going to be executed as a matter of time. Would I like to sign this confession first? I refused, of course, because it was in Arabic for one thing. But secondly, because once you sign that, that is your death sentence. Mm. Mm. Um, I didn't know if they were going to torture me into signing it, which they could have. They had already staged a mock execution at that point. They had taken a gun, Kalashnikov put it to my head, started to pull the trigger, uh, which they was only held halfway. And then the gunman, after what seemed like a long time, sm uh, looked up in the sky, laughed and smashed the barrel of the gun on my knee. That was on my first night of uh, 26 days of captivity. You were very sanguine about this. You were delivering this horror um, in a very simple way. Mm -hmm. um, is that because you've taken time since to process it? But at the time, <clears throat> it must have been abject terror. And you were already a foreign correspondent. But for the, the poor souls that have been grabbed from peaceful situations in their communities. It, it, can you give us a sense of what the terror they might be feeling, the uncertainty, the, you know, the, the horror of it all? Yes, you're right. It, was much, it is much worse for people who are just snatched from nowhere, yeah. especially civilians. I had experience of wars, so I kind of expected that something could go wrong at some point. So uh, I don't know how I can describe what they're going through, uh, except it was probably it's a lot worse than what, what I went through, except that I had two mock executions, they God. probably haven't had that because they're useful, they are bargaining chips. However, I, I believe only a small number of them are bargaining chips, so Hamas has a surplus, as it were, that they can use. Do you think use. maybe they took more than they intended? <clears throat> because there will be... No-one's got sympathy, by the way, but, but they will be finding it a challenge to feed, water, sustain the hostages, or will they just not care? They will see most of the hostages as being, as I said, valuable mm. uh, chips to exchange for some sort of deal and also to delay Israel's ground assault, which I think they do fear. Uh, they've been degraded militarily in the last few days at a huge cost to their population. 
and probably their popularity is not that high inside Gaza, though we don't know. And the last thing they really need is a, is a ground war which degrades them much further. So uh, using the hostages <coughs> as a bargaining chip mm. or exchanging a few here and there is a good tactic. And we must talk about the families who are waiting for their... Mm -hmm. praying for their survival and, and their release. You, you, when you were being held, you had a wife and two mm -hmm. children who were, what, in their teens when you, were, when you were taken. They must have gone through the agonies of hell in that month. Well, my wife certainly suffered a lot. She helped a campaign to help me get out that might have helped because we got Archbishop Desmond Tutu. I was mm. an anti-apartheid activist in my youth in South Africa mm. before I came here. He wrote a letter to Hamas. He was a very strong supporter of the Palestinians, saying, how can you lock this man up? Whether that helped or not, I don't know. I had a couple of British MPs came to Gaza for other reasons and asked for my release. These may all have helped, but these citizens are in a different political ball game. Mm. What mm. sort of game, do you want to talk about game? They played games with you, two, not one, but two mock executions um, of a trumped up confession, etc. Um, what do you make of the release of the hostages now? Um, obviously, you've talked about them being bargaining chips, but what was, for example, what's in their thinking about releasing the two elderly women last night? Well, I think that was part of the overall intention of Hamas to delay things, first of all. Mm -hmm. Secondly, to try and gain some brownie points. That's a horrible way of putting it. But mm. to gain some, some support uh, around the Arab world, where they probably are strongly criticised for having provoked this attack on their, with their massacre on, yes. on uh, October the 7th. Um, and it, it benefits them to look, at least appear, humanitarian, even though it's only two people or four people in total mm. out of over 200. Mm. Was Before there any sense of you understanding them more by being held hostage? Mm -hmm. Or did you come away thinking you're evil? No, I, I never, as a journalist, go into this good and evil thing. I'm there to report what people say and do and think. And I found that there were different types of people within Hamas. I've known that for some time, but my jailers, for example, one of them was very pleasant and very nice and said he hated being there, didn't like to have to hear torture every day around the, the place and would like to leave, but he couldn't. We spoke in Arabic, yeah. uh, my broken Arabic, and he would like to leave. The others, there were a couple of beat me up. Um, so there, there are different types of people amongst the Hamas uh, mm. ac activists and all of them are, in a sense, held prisoner by the situation mm. or by their leadership. And it's the leadership of Hamas that we should be really worrying about. To our astonishment, before this interview began this morning, you told us that you were released, you came back, then you went back to Gaza. You went back. Yes, because they, my, my... They let you back in. They let me back in. They all, in a sense, that was a huge apology for having done what they did. Oh. Uh, and the deputy head of Hamas invited me back. I wasn't sure if this was some kind of a trap to get me back there again, but I decided that, in general, they couldn't afford to lock me up yet again, especially as I'd been there and they hadn't killed me. So I went back just for a day and a half just to show that I could report from there mm. and uh, had a few unnerving experiences I'm, while yeah. I was there for that day and a half, but I'm still here. Finally, last night, um, we saw that one of the women who was being released, one of the hostages, actually shook hands quite warmly with one of her captors. What would you, what would you read into that? Well, these were old people who mm. must be tremendously relieved to be out. Mm. And people do react in, in a way which may, maybe when she looks back on it, she'll think that wasn't very uh, sensible to do. Um, but it may be that particular captor had been treating her like well. One, like yours, mm. yeah, yeah. Well, look, it's fascinating talking to you. brave to do so, and she was yeah. trying to acknowledge that. Yeah. Goodness, it's fascinating we... talking to you. Thank you so much for coming in and sharing that with us. That's a really interesting. I mean, don't go to it. But you... you... You are listening to that as we are. It, it's an extraordinary insight, isn't it? It, it is. And uh, no, Paul is incredibly calm now, but I, you know, it's, it's still... It's a struggle to imagine the turmoil and the yeah. fear, the terror you must have had. And, of course, the hostages now, the 200 or so who are there. Look, uh, the Saturday morning, 7th of October, they've been having coffee, you know, taking mm. kids to... Yeah. Uh, you know, whatever they do, mm. um, mm. you know, worship, you know, you know whatever. Yeah. What, what, whatever, and then all of a sudden you find yourself there. But you can see from Hamas's point of view, they're using them as human shields, that's a war crime. But it works in one way, because there's enormous turmoil in Israel. Now, Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister, has failed in his fundamental duty to protect the nation. He always said he would, I'd be tough, I'll protect you. 1,400 have been slaughtered, 200 have been captured. And the families of the hostages are 
arguing in many cases, do not invade because you will kill mm -hmm. yeah. our family. You've got to negotiate. Mm -hmm. You've got to you've got to get them out. So they they are they're bargaining chips. They are Hamas's most powerful weapon at the moment. It's absolutely awful, but that's what they. Uh, but that's if what it they leads are. to some kind of process. Obviously, it is awful. No one can yes, argue yeah, yeah, anything yeah. other way. Yeah. Is it a step forward against this horrific, you know, standoff? And we see slaughter on one side, terror, and as you say, fourteen hundred dead on the. Mm. You know, something's got to change in well, here. Well, hasn't we, it? Have, we have to hope, but uh, these these uh, hostages should be released uh, immediately. They have been taken. Uh, absolutely innocent uh, yeah. civilians caught up. And innocent civilians are dying on all sides of this uh, at the moment. It's absolutely appalling. Now, Kevin's right, they are human shields, and you can see that there's been a certain amount of pressure behind the scenes on the Israeli government not to mount a ground incursion. That's partly because of these hostages and they want to see them released safely, but also uh, because the US has got its interest in the region. It's also mm. worried about Iran. So we just hope... I mean, you just think... You just hear Paul's story here. Mm. Thinking about these hostages being held captive in those circumstances. Mm -hmm. And these two, these two ladies, one of them was taken sideways uh, on a motorbike out of... I mean, mm. it's just they all, they all won't be, They all won't be in one place. If you, if you think you're Hamas, you would dot them around oh, yeah. in small yeah. groups. Yes, yeah, just and, yeah. and if you're an Israeli soldier or you're, you're firing missiles, or what, your, your nightmare is killing Israelis. That's... Well, that's uh, right. Just before you go, Paul, one last question. What can the rest of the world do now? What is the <clears throat> stance they can best take to give the best chance for the hostages to survive and be released? Well, the first thing you have to ask is, is Israel's priority, total priority, to get the hostages out, or do they have an overall ambition to get rid of Hamas? And if in the process of doing so, of, of their control over Gaza, they have to kill people who turn out to be their their own citizens, they may feel, they'll never say it publicly, they may feel it's a price worth paying. You know, they're expendable. Well, I don't think they would look at it that way, but the fact is, in a war, you're going to lose people on all sides. Mm. And sadly, <laughs> I think because of what happened with Gilad Shalit, mm. who was in, in prison at the same time as I was, not in the same place, uh, he's a soldier who was captured by Hamas uh, before I was, was held mm. for up to five years, and in exchange for him, they had to give over a 1,000... Palestinian prisoners who'd been sentenced for what, what they call terrorist crimes. Yeah. So the Israelis know they cannot afford to go into that kind of bargaining round again. So I think the hostages are their second priority. All right, thank you very much oh, indeed for your time this morning. Fascinating.